So we are live. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. And uh, I'm really excited today to have with us Ryan Hammond, who is the executive director of the Eagles Autism Foundation. Hi, Ryan. Thanks for being with us. Thanks so much for having me. Really excited to talk to everyone and hopefully answer some questions and just share a little bit about what's going on with us. Oh, that's awesome. Thank you. So, um, well, let's just start off by telling folks watching what the Eagles Autism Foundation is and does. Absolutely. So the Eagles Autism Foundation really, um, it's kind of evolved since it started. It started as the Eagles Autism Challenge uh, back in 2017, really with the vision of our owner, Jeffrey Laurie. He has a personal connection to autism, and he just saw the prevalence rate continuing to rise, the need in the community just getting you know greater and greater with special ed and education and access to care and employment. There's so many different things. And then also knowing that research is underfunded. So how does something that's so personal that he supported like hundreds of millions of dollars with his family foundation quietly for so long, how does he use a platform for the Philadelphia Eagles to really change people's lives, to bring people together and to talk about something, you know, autism is kind of tough. You know, you think about some of the other organizations and not to say that, that anything is more important or less important, but, you know, cancer has a survivor story. You're waiting for it to get better. Autism is a lifelong condition that, you know, you're just learning to do interventions to manage and improve people's quality of life. So it was definitely interesting, I think, to take the platform of the Eagles and really our ability to bring people together, to open people's eyes, to educate them and to drive critical resources into the field. So, you know, he's definitely inspiring with his goals and I've been excited to join. We we, um, we got started with a bike ride, run, walk, and our first year we raised over two and a half million dollars and we committed to giving every dollar to autism research and care in Philadelphia. And we just saw the response from our fans. I think people bleed green and they, you know, when we put the call out for them to join us, they answered. And I think that was the moment that that day when we saw everyone together and we saw the funds raised, we knew we could be more. So, you know, as we've evolved, we're now uh, doing autism 365 days a year. And for those who don't know, we are one of the first NFL teams to open a sensory room in our stadium. Lincoln Financial Field is uh, certified sensory inclusive. So for fans with autism, they have access to visual schedules, a special gate to enter, enter that's sensory friendly, the sensory room to take breaks because, you know, when you think about sporting events, you don't think about if a child or an adult is having a difficult time, there's no re-entry rule, right? You can't just right. take a break and come back in. So how do you create a safe environment? So we opened the sensory room and then since we really inventoried everything we do as an organization and making sure that it's inclusive from, we recently had our uh, cheer clinic last year and we had nonverbal girls with autism participating. Oh my God. And it's just been incredible. Yeah, and I think that's the most amazing thing is we found a way to meet families where they need us and to deliver experiences that otherwise, you know, weren't accessible to them. So it's been amazing. So since we started, we've now gone from Eagles Autism Challenge, which is more of our event, to Eagles Autism Foundation. When you watch an Eagles game on TV, you see Eagles Autism Foundation in our end zone. So that just draws attention to how important our commitment is. So every time we're scoring, we're kicking a field goal, you can see Eagles Autism Foundation there. And it just sends a message to you know the fans and the families that we are committed. So it's been amazing so far. We've raised now over $7 million and counting and uh, invested in amazing research. So we're really excited about what the future holds and, and understand that this is a responsibility we have to the community that we're excited to address. Oh my gosh, that is so incredible. I have chills. I'm so proud of us as a city. And, you know, it's so incredible to see, like you said, the Eagles have a big platform, right? And we do, we really, as a city, support our sports teams and we bleed green. And, and I love that. And you guys are using the platform to do something really important and call attention to something really important. That's really incredible. I love that. So I want to talk about you for a second. You, prior to doing this role, you were with the Kinney Center at, at St. Joe's. I'm a St. Joe's grad, by the way. So okay. talk, talk will never die. <laughs> mm -hmm, that's right. So, um, so tell me a little bit more about how you got involved in and, and interested in this work because you've been doing this for some time. Yeah, so it's interesting. My career started actually at the Eagles in marketing. In uh, 1998, I was an intern. In 2000, I was full time. And in 2008, you know, my personal life kind of didn't match the needs of working, you know, seven days a week, seven months a year for football season at that point. And um, 
you know, knew I wanted to get into nonprofit, something bigger than myself. I felt like that was a lot what the Eagles gave me as a young professional and uh, just the ability to be creative and grow and really just kind of go all in with an organization. So had the opportunity to go to St. Joe's University at a really critical time. They had just purchased Episcopal. So with a gift from the McGuire family and um, added to their campus and then another family, um, the Honduras family were in talks to start an autism center. So they actually led with um, a $7 million gift to start the center and found it. And I just happened to be like a little bit right place, right time. I went in and I had all these different experiences and connections in the city. So when they looked at who was kind of in the fundraising uh, advancement office, I just had a unique skill set. And when I met with the Honduras family, it just was a perfect blend. And they shared with me their goals. And I think just like the Eagles, they're inspired to do it by their personal connection. And I think, you know, it was about their son and providing support for families who didn't have the resources that they had. Mm -hmm. So for me to have the ability to, you know, jump in, it became personal to me. So it, you know, I was able to make this, you know, a part of who I was, I jumped in head first. And I mean, my I have daughters, they became peer mentors for kids with autism. I learned everything that I could do. And I think again, when you're in it with a family, it just becomes, you know, like I said, it, it's personal. And I felt like being touched by that experience and then leading me back to the Eagles for this experience is the same thing with Jeffrey. I feel like an immense sense of responsibility for these families because they're being leaders. They're putting themselves out there uh, really because they have the means to do what they need to do for their children or their sibling. But to be that for other people is just so inspiring. And I feel really blessed to be in you know the position to find this calling, but more importantly, to kind of continue to live it out for over the past 10 years. That's so incredible. I love that. It's so interesting to hear how people get into their work and and you have such an amazing job where you do get to help firsthand kind of every day, which is so incredible. Um, so yeah. you talked about how the foundation really started as an event. And, you know, events right now are just, you know, completely changing with the COVID-19 situation and um, everything from, you know, planned events to graduations are moving virtual, kind of everything's changing. Um, and that included your signature fundraising event, the Eagles Autism Challenge. So uh, I wonder if you could just talk a little about the, the way you all innovated and how you changed things to, to address that move. Absolutely. I mean, we definitely had to, well, at first I think, and everyone can relate, right? It was, we're going to be closed for two weeks. Uh, we're going to not do any, you know, not have large gatherings in that time period. And then it kept creeping up and extending longer. And then I think the landscape just became so unknown. So while we jumped into action to just make alternative plans initially, we quickly realized that that wasn't going to play out the way that we had hoped. And I think for us, we took a step back first and foremost and said, okay, we don't want to cancel our event. We want to postpone it, but we need to be mindful of the situation. If we're under stay at home orders, it's not responsible for us to just say the event's going to be on this day, right? As much as we're planning internally and have, as much as we want to do it, we want to make sure everyone's safe. And that's the most important thing. So I think when we look at who we are and what we've done over the past year, and I talked about autism 365 days a year, we really just said, you know, what can we do in this time to be productive? How can we live our mission and really impact people in a positive way? So we really shifted our communication that, you know, March 13th, our last day in the office, uh, moving forward, we stopped really being aggressive with fundraising and asking people to register the, for the event. And we tried to like put on our hat of being really a resource into the community. You know, how can we get out information where, you know, food delivery was happening for individuals with disabilities in Philadelphia? You know, we launched a Sensory Saturdays program. So families, you're at home with your children. How There's a lot of activities for typical kids, but for kids with autism, they need a little bit more care and visual schedules and just, you know, walking them through it in a systematic way, in a way that could also support families to kind of hand over hand, help them, you know, accomplish these fun activities. So we launched that series and then also considered what about people that are on the autism spectrum that also had their work life disrupted? They're now home and, you know, in talking to folks, even, you know, our friends at Wawa, one of our sponsors for our event and Lincoln Financial Group, you know, they have programs. And the one thing that, you know, the folks at Wawa said is, you know, you train these individuals and they get, you know, they understand all their role. And then now 
they had to work to get to be that greeter or they work to be the sample person. And now you're telling them they can't go close to customers and maybe they're at risk. So how are they navigating? Uh, so we worked with SAP actually and had a couple of their folks featured on talking about you know, how they're navigating being on the autism spectrum and working from home. Because again, typical mm -hmm. folks are adjusting. I mean, I know I'm adjusting with being home, my husband's home, my kids are home. And it's like in between meetings, I had to Google on how to, you know, divide mixed fractions the other day. So, you know, it's just, I think we're in this time of uncertainty. And I think that's really what we wanted to show is that we are all in this together and that we will be here with you no matter what as a resource. And, you know, we can shift and evolve too. So that's really what we have tried to do is make sure that families have tools and resources at home, make sure we can support other organizations that are doing innovative things to help make families' lives easier. And just again, share information in a responsible way. I love the way your team has really been able to anticipate what the needs of the community might be. Um, you know, you're, you're dealing yourselves, like you said, with working from home and we're all kind of dealing with this change in schedule. It's so hard. Um, and yeah, the math is no joke. Trying to help the kids with the math is no joke. I, I too am Googling things like, I don't actually know how to do this. Um, but I think it's so admirable that your team was able to look out ahead of wow, what would our families that we help support need in this time? Um, one of the things I saw on your site that I thought was really, really neat was um, the daily schedule. So do you want to mention what the daily schedule is? Sure. So again, I think a lot of people with autism, they're visual learners, and I think they also thrive in structure. So we felt like for families who ne necessarily aren't those folks that are doing the interventions that they would receive in school or in various programs, how do we bring those tools to them? There's so many individuals that love the Eagles. How do we make it you know, exciting? So we gave them the opportunity to build their own visual schedule. So it's very flexible with all different tasks that you could do throughout the day. And you can almost make your own board for your child based on their specific needs their interests. So again, that's just another example of what we've been able to do to deliver those tools for families. And I mentioned earlier, we had our first virtual or we had our first cheer clinic that was inclusive with, you know, young girls with autism participating and, you know, otherwise their families didn't see this as a possibility for them. Well, now we did our first mm -hmm. virtual cheer clinic and we had all the supports in place. So we had a number of other individuals with autism that were able to participate because they were able to follow the visual schedule related to the cheer clinic and to be able to know what to expect and be successful. And I had a number of videos from families showing me their kiddos, you know, dancing in front of the TV screen. And they were just like, you know, it melts your heart. And to know that you play a role in giving them access to these experiences that again, all of their typical peers want to do as well. It's just really special. Oh, that's so incredible. I love this. This is the great conversation that I'm having this week because it just gives you a lot of hope to realize all the, the wonderful things that are happening in, in a challenging time, right? Um, so, you know, you guys have really done such a good job of pivoting and, and refocusing your teams. Um, what advice would you have for other folks who have events that have had to be postponed or, or maybe, you know, canceled for this year? Um, how can they, you know, kind of stay engaged and stay excited about their work? Yeah, I mean, I have a couple, you know, recommendations that I try and let, live by essentially is, you know, know your mission and own it. Why are you there? What is the reason for your work and how can you continue to carry it out and reimagine right in this given uncertainty? And I think that's just the first and foremost, you know, priority for me is being true to our mission and everything that we do. We know we're here to change lives for people affected by autism. And, you know, it might look a little different than just, you know, having that event or that fundraiser. But I, again, just being able to stay true to that and, and having that sense of identity. Don't try to be someone you're not just because the landscape has changed find a way to kind of reimagine and blend yourself into it. Um, and then I would say just find ways to engage with people and, you know, to have those touch points. One of the things we were able to do, and again, you know, being the Eagles, we do have access to these really special things, but the draft was like the most watched draft, I think, in like 10 years or maybe longer. Uh, and we were able to have some of our families that participate in the Eagles Autism Challenge be on the screen behind Roger Goodell when our draft picks were announced. So, you know, that was a way to engage families. We've since been able to work with our players and we've done um, 
virtual Zooms where we've had some of our families ask the players questions. And again, you see everyone's alike when we're all in this situation. This isn't isolated to just us or our organization or other, you know, everyone's in it. We had, uh, you know, Brandon Graham did the one show for us and he's like in his car, he just takes his mask off, he has groceries in the back and he's like, I waited in line to get the groceries. So I think people have had a glimpse of seeing, you know, even our players are affected and how they've, you know, continuously tried to do their workouts, stay engaged with their teammates. So I think that's a lot of it too. Find unique ways to have these touch points so you still have that sense of community. And then I think the third thing is just to, to communicate. And I think it's a fine line because again, I struggle that we haven't been able to share as many details about the postponed event, but making sure that people still hear from us. They know that they're important to us and they know that you know without them, we, we, we don't exist, right? We're not here. This is about more than anything, a community. So I think those are the most important things. It's about mission. It's about creative engagement. And then it, it, it's about communication as well. You guys have done such a good job. I, I, I love the, the first tip on and just remembering your mission and, and thinking about who you are and what does that mean in our current situation? And, and you've done such a good job of that. And, and I really appreciate that. I really like that. Um, so how do you think in-person events will change going forward? Will we, will we have in-person events again? I hope so. Oh, I think we're, you know, I think eventually... We're just social creatures. We have to be together. So I think as hard as this is right now, I think we all need to understand that, you know, we had a meeting this morning and it was, you know, who's essential versus not essential and knowing that everyone's essential to make our business work. It's just that, and there's no significance of importance, whether you're in person right now, it's about taking responsibility for everyone's health and safety. So I think for the time being, you know, it can be tough that you're in, a, you're not, you know, in the normal state, you're not bringing people together and running a 5k today. Right. But I think it's, you know, working towards obviously the CDC guidelines and the safety precautions, you know, even if we are able to have our event in the fall, you know, we're not going to have buffets of food. We'll have individually wrapped food. So it's little things between that and how do we social distance people and do people wear masks to participate in these events? Or, you know, if you're all outside, are there other, you know, standards that you can follow? And then I think it's, again, playing that long game, knowing that you will be back together, you know, in the future. And it's mm -hmm. about how you engage people, keep people connected and make them feel a sense of your community that you'll maintain those members of your community in the future. I love that. I, I, I think this is where the innovation and creativity comes in, right? It's really, we're going to have to get innovative. We're going to have to get creative about how we do things to, you know, going forward and some things will be in a reality, but we will be better again and, and be able to, to have events. And I'm really looking forward to that time. Um, Absolutely. So, I mean, so many things that you've said kind of give me hope and, and I'm really excited because, you know, it's been it's been hard. We've been home for a long time and and we're all still adjusting, even though it's been a while. Um, but what else is, is kind of giving you hope? I'm, I'm curious, like what keeps you engaged and excited? I, you, you've talked about it a lot, I think, with the families that you work with. Are there other things that we haven't talked about that give you hope? Keep you I mean, I think, you know, for me as a mom, as a professional, I think, you know, you just have to stay positive. You have to stay the course because, you know, as parents or even, you know, for me leading our team, right? You have to be the person that reassures them it's going to be okay, that you get buy-in, that everyone feels safe, you know, from my children to my team at the Eagles to make sure that they all feel respected and heard and, and just understanding that, you know, when you're face to face, you you can understand social cues and you understand what people's needs are and styles of communication. And it's about being able to be flexible and adapt to other people's needs. So I think we've seen so much success and people being open to new things. I think that certainly gives me hope because I think you can easily have said people were more likely to kind of stay in their lane or stick to, you know, what their role is or what they do. But I think to see people really evolve and say, you know, I'm up for anything. I want to contribute in any way I can. And having these meaningful levels of engagement. Um, again, I think it's about people feeling valued. And when then you feel that they are valued, you're inspired to just continue to keep taking things to the next level. So I think that's, that's for me, I think it starts with being positive and understanding my responsibility as, you know, a leader, you know, like I said, at home on my team and contributing to the organization. It, it's, it's not questioning my value. It's asserting it and saying that we're all in this, we're all valuable. And 
while it might look a little different or feel a little different for people at times, it's still, you know, they're still contributing and without them, it wouldn't be possible. You, you're you're clearly very good at that, right? Like it comes through, even through the screen, it just comes through that you have this optimism and that I think you're probably very good. Maybe you picked up some tips from the cheer clinic, but I think we're very good at kind of getting people to gather behind you. And it is, it's an enormous sense of responsibility when you're leading at home or at work, right? And making sure that everybody's feeling that. So I really like that and appreciate that about you. Um, so you. what are you most looking forward to when, when we're no longer in quarantine? What, what's the first thing you wanna do? I mean, have lunch at the Novacare complex. I mean, I do really miss, <laughs> like, I. That's fair. Definitely the thing I miss the most is, like, you know, being with my colleagues and having those, like, five minute conversations in between. I mean, again, I don't think I, I haven't stayed home with my family this long since maternity leaves. So, you know, I mean, this is like a whole new thing for me too. And with that comes, I've never done this many dishes or cooked this much in my life as well. So I certainly appreciate, you know, our folks at Novacare that take care of us and, you know, feel spoiled and so blessed to have them, but also just the opportunity with so many amazing colleagues to see on the day to day. I really would be excited to see them, but it's nice to catch up with them virtual. And uh, again, reach out to someone. Even last week, I reached out via text to one of my colleagues that I just would typically see in the hall, but not necessarily, I haven't had any IT issues lately, so I, I haven't needed an IT guy. But just like sent him a text and was like, hey, how you doing? Like, how are things going? Like, are you guys doing okay? So just like being proactive with those, you know, communications and continuing those relationships, I think is just gonna make it more exciting when we're all back together. I know. I can't wait. I can't. We, we've been talking. I have a small team. We've been talking about just sitting out in the park and having a coffee together. We're almost at the point where we can do that. Right. And that would be amazing. Um, but yeah, yeah, it's it's going to be great to get back together. So um, we have a few minutes left. Tell us how people can get involved, whether it's um, families with autism experience, you know, autism in their families who want to access resources or on the other side, how people can support the Eagles Autism Foundation. Sure. Well, families certainly can start with subscribing to our social media channels because that's where we are putting a lot of our resources. Even if we have it live on our website, a lot of times we're highlighting it on social and they have the opportunity to engage. We said, you know, we've had days where ask a question to our behavior analyst, you know, on how to work through strategies at home. So being a tool and resource for families certainly starts with our social media engagement and knowing that they can reach out to us for anything. Um, they can certainly get involved in the community by participating in our event and, you know, however that happens, hopefully in the fall, definitely fingers crossed. And then there's other ways you can donate and know that 100% of your donation is going directly into supporting autism care. And, you know, one thing I didn't talk about is how we give the money away. And I think it's so interesting because a lot of foundations you know, they raise money and, and then they write a check to an organization. And we've just stepped away from those transactional donations because of really Jeffrey's leadership, right? He wants to make the biggest impact in people's lives. So we actually hired a scientific advisor who helps me as I gather proposals for um, from local organizations on research. He then matches those proposals with experts from around the country. And then those experts read the proposals with us. And then based on the ranking system of the best proposals that we receive, those are then what's funded. So I think, you know, that level of security as to there's accountability there, they have to give us progress reports year one to make sure year two funding is coming. So I think the level of rigor that we place in that funding process is just really I think, great for someone who is interested in philanthropy and supporting autism, because they know that one, they can, through metrics track what project their dollars supported, what impact it's having and what the trajectory is in the future. So I think that's been, you know, for me really exciting. So I have this role of leading the foundation and having a fundraising event and doing all these community engagements. And then I have this whole side of this scientific process where I've learned so much, but I credit, you know, Jeffrey Lurie and his vision to not be transactional and to really dig in and make sure that the research isn't being duplicated, that it has measurable outcomes and really is has the ability to transform lives. So it's been a very exciting thing. And I encourage people, you know, again, who have an interest in supporting autism to, you know, potentially make an investment with us so they know where their dollars go and they can, you can go on our website, you can watch the scientific review process. We kind of filmed it, it felt like a reality show a little bit. Oh, wow. We all flew down to Florida, we were in Jeffrey's home 
all of the scientists with us and all the projects were being you know evaluated and then again knowing that all of those dollars we we now have 17 research projects in philadelphia that are all being funded in over six million dollars of investments from the organization so you know it's just the beginning so it's really exciting and we would love for people to enjoy it or enjoy us and also you know consider us for their support oh that's so incredible all right so everyone watching follow eagles autism foundation on social and ryan what's your website it's eaglesautismfoundation.org all right, so eaglesautismfoundation.org. And when you make a donation, you will know that it is being backed by science and your dollars are going to programs that are really making a difference and to families in the area. So that's really incredible. Um, yeah, and the last, I was gonna say, yeah. the last thing that I would share that's just something that's unique is we have a lot of partners join us for this. I think the one thing that the Eagles, we talked about it bringing people together, but it also brings organizations together. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Lincoln Financial, course they it's Lincoln Financial Field but they stepped up as our presenting sponsor for us you know with this event and now they since started an autism at work program and it's just to see that they're literally you know joining us in these efforts and SAP has autism at work Wawa is incredible I mean the number of individuals that they hire you know that has disabilities and the support they provide is, is immeasurable I mean the, the support is just incredible so I think that's where you know you can't do it alone so how do you bring these thought leaders together and then you know move the needle and again we have great hospitals in our area children's hospital you know working with drexel jefferson penn it, it's just been a way for us to be a magnet in so many ways and have these folks come together for thought leadership and most, most importantly for change so it's so incredible. So if you're an individual, you, you can donate. If you're an organization, you can reach out to Ryan about becoming a partner, perhaps. Um, there are so many ways to get involved. And you guys are you're really just making me happy for the week. I feel so good about the work That's that awesome. you're doing. It's so great. It's so fantastic. Um, so Ryan Hammond, thank you so, so much for being with us. And we hope you have a great rest of the week. And we'll talk to you soon. Thanks so much. Thanks, everyone. Bye, guys.